This evening I'm talking to Simon, a tax expert. Uh, he works for one of the top 100 law uh, tax consultancy firms in the country and he's going to share with you how you can save money by getting around legally section 24. Uh, if you want to find out, go and have a listen and I'm pretty sure you will learn some stuff tonight. That will save you a lot of money in the future. How exactly can you help people with tax challenges? Uh, and I, I know one of your specialities is the Section 24 changes, um, which affects many landlords. Yeah, I'm, I'm always a great question. I'm always surprised actually, you know, all these years on, how many landlords don't fully understand Section 24. Um, they call it the stealth tax, the landlord tax, the tenant tax. You know, it's been around now since um, 2015. It was announced in the summer budget and came into an impact on the 6th of April 2017. It's an amendment to UK tax law, which means that landlords can no longer use all of their mortgage interest as a cost. So as of this current tax year, 80% of your mortgage payments turns into taxable income. And that, uh, that's based on whether you're a 40% taxpayer or not. I think there's another area of confusion. The way we calculate it is we take all your rental income, any other income you've got, and then add 80% of your mortgage payments. If that pushes you over the 50k threshold, then the section 24 applies, and now you're not receiving that interest relief that you would have had received before section 24 came through. So we have an instant fix for this, but that's what section 24 is. It was a phase tax that came in from um, 17, 18, 19 and 20 where it reduced the amount of mortgage interest that you could use and in the current year it's 0% and then they give you a 20% credit back. So essentially 80% of your mortgage payments can no longer be used against your uh, rental income as a cost and therefore it turns straight into a tax charge at 40% for the majority. And no. when we we got consultations and we work out the tax on that and we look at it over 10 years, it is a shocking amount of money, money that's going to the revenue. And it's all avoidable. We can, we can take you out of it pretty much instantly. So, just to be absolutely clear for people, um, I normally use an example um, of you know, their profit as a 40% taxpayer on a property that they've bought that they've got £500 a month mortgage on and a thousand pound a month rent income. Okay, so um, if before they're only paying tax on, it wouldn't even be 500 because they'd still be able to take their insurance off and yeah, the it, deductibles and maybe agency fees and that sort of thing. So potentially they're left with 400 pound profit after they paid their mortgage, yeah? Um, yeah. that they've got to pay tax on. So if they're a 40% taxpayer, uh, or to 80 or so 160 of that is tax, uh, and that leaves them with um, the balance of 120, uh, 240 profit. Does that make sense? Are you following yeah. that? Because if, if you're not, nobody is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on that model, you know, the 500 mortgage, 400 of that now turns into a taxable income yeah. so it becomes part of whatever profits I worked out after you've taken off your cost between the difference and, between the rent you know, and if, and you, the, if you assumed your cost for letting fees and uh, insurance is 100 quid out of that uh, if you actually can't get interest re relief on that 500 and you're paying tax on uh, £900 at 40%, that actually means that you're no longer making a profit on that rental property, uh, everything's going to the revenue. Yeah, sure. very close to it. Yeah. So, yeah, it is um, quite horrendous. And why it's so sensible for people to come and talk to you. Now, your other expertise is, uh, and I think potentially we might be talking to him next week, is about trust funds and making sure you've got uh, trusts and things for your portfolio to, to make sure that you know, nobody, the tax man, can't come and take the money that you leave for your kids. Yeah, I think that um, and next week Phil's going to be at Wills and Trusts, one of our other team members that heads up another division. 
and he'll be looking at um, a whole plan that he can do around wills and trusts and you know avoiding the nursing care home trap and some things my team deal with inheritance tax too and probably one of the gold standards in, in planning that we have here is that um, if we can organize your affairs such that your assets sit within a limited company and there's lots of journeys to get there if you're not there already and if you are there already um, we can use a trust which is a very powerful way a very proven way too of essentially mitigating inheritance tax for the next 150 years so not only do you half of your estate to, to death duties of 40 percent on your equity it means your children your children's children and children's children will not be paying inheritance tax on the assets held within the limited company because the trust does its job and what we particularly like about that group is we've we've had sadly over the years uh, three people die we've had gone through probate revenue have looked at it and come back and we actually have the letters in black and white slightly redacted to not share the personal details but enough so that you can see that they're quite happy with that planning and the trust is being used in the right way and the trust has lots of other benefits too you know I think the thing that people really love about it is when they pass it to their children and they're not too sure who they're going to marry or how their lives are going to work out. The trust protects against divorce and bankruptcy for the children. So, um, and that's really, I think, when the landlord's uh, eyes really start to light up going, that we find very attractive. Now, how do we get there? And uh, of course, for everybody, you'll be in a different place. That's why we have these free consultations that you can reach out to them for. And uh, he'll give you the link and you can book in and spend some time with us and we'll take you individually on your own journey. Cool. Um, and uh, I've actually come up with a, a headline that I think you should perhaps be using. And certainly when we uh, mention people um, uh, on our e emails to everyone, and it is uh, tax you have to pay really is a four-letter word, the word tax. Okay, let us help you say a four-letter word to the revenue. <laughs> so, how, how's that for your tagline? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure. I quite get away with that one. I might be too insightful, <laughs> but I, I share your sentiment. I do share your sentiment, and I, I think you know. Years ago, the law lords were asked, you know, what is the right amount of tax to pay? And it's been in, it's been in law for many, many years now. And he said, you know, the job of you, and you can, you can judge the title when this was said, the job of the individual is to ensure that they protect their store of coal and the revenue do not put their shovel in deeply and do not put it in often. And the job of the revenue is to make sure they get a large shovel and they dig it in as hard as they can and as often as they can. And that is about tax planning. So, you know, we all have the ability to go out there and put plans in place and structures and so on in order that we are the most tax efficient we can be. And therefore, it's about planning. It's about forward planning. It's about being proactive. And I think the thing that breaks my heart the biggest in this industry is the amount of landlords that have not yet sat down with a professional, taken professional advice, and then put it into action always sitting there worrying about is it the right thing to do and the reality is that if you look at the costs at the moment with interest rates at an all-time low that it is the right thing to do for people that have gone through that process you know if interest rates were to go back to seven percent we'd probably lose half our landlords in the uk because of the landlord tax because yeah, every look, two uh, goes up, it's horrendous the impact it has yeah and it will be a very slow process, but last time interest rates went up 6%, rentals in Milton Keynes went up by 100 quid over a period of time, because landlords had to react to, you know, stop making a loss. So, yeah, yeah it, there will be. Really yeah, I've worked with yeah. lots of, over years, I've worked with lots of letting agents, you know, and some have been my mentors, and they always talk about the ratchet effect, where, you know, the property prices go up and then rentals follow over time or you find that interest rates go up and then eventually what follows is rental there's always a lag between the yeah. rental going up and yeah. the cost of the landlord and of course we've got to finance that and it was about six months before um, more of you know people don't if they're comfortable they tend not to increase their rents um, okay I've got another sentence to throw at you um, <laughs> the richer you are proportionally to what you earn, you pay a lot less tax. 
Yeah, I think that, um, gosh, you know, we advise over 6,000 businesses, 18,000 individuals, lots of celebrity, Formula One stars, the chefs and so on. And I'd say the richer you are, the better your advisors. You know, you upgrade your accountant, you upgrade your tax advice, you, you upgrade a whole series of people around you so that you get the best, best advice, so that you can have a, something in place that works for you, that keeps you efficient, that keeps you legal and above board, that makes you sleep at night, and um, that's the right way forward. And yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think it's those people that don't wake up to that fact, that don't realise that, you know, as your business grows, as your asset grows, as your wealth base grows, you need to upgrade your advisors. And, uh, you know, I quite often find myself telling people that. Yeah, and the, the, um, the, my whole point was, with the right tax advice, proportionally, the more you earn, the less percentage of it you have to pay across to the tax man. Uh, it, it literally does work backwards. Um, but there we go. Um, and also, it's probably because if you go back to your thing with the law lords, okay, if you if we ask them the question again, the law lord would turn around and say, "Yeah, it's my duty to make sure." The, the law lords and the rich don't have to pay any tax because most of it's been paid by the majority. Yeah, the vast majority, that is, that is true. That is true. Uh, Very true. You know, and there's nothing worse than being an employee on 100, 150, 200 grand a year because they are the hardest hit out of everyone from tax. Yeah, I was with a team today actually, doing uh, the Russian bank as part something else I was doing, and you know, all the boys on that call were half a million a year on PAY, and you know, the leading tax, left, right and centre, but yeah. you know, there are other entrepreneurs that own our own companies, or are sole traders, or partnerships, or whatever people we will do. Of course, the options for us are vast, and, uh, but like everything, you know, you can be an expert in buying property and managing your portfolio, but when it comes to tax, it's very, very complicated. We have walls of books with UK tax law. It's a bit like UK planning law. It's vast, it's complicated. And um, some of it's poorly written, uh, which creates all sorts of opportunities for good advice and good tax planning to get people advantage, which is why we can take people out of Section 24 immediately. Yeah. Okay, look, it's time for me to hand over to everyone on here and give them the opportunity to ask any questions they've got while they've got a, an expert on the line. Um, so please feel free to uh, type away. Um, Fitzroy's just said immediately, say I'm not quite sure what you need to expand on that question, Fitzroy, unless I've missed a plot on that one. Um, so we have got questions starting to come in. Uh, here we go. Laurie uh, asked me this question a couple of days after your last talk, and I said, come back when you're on again. Um, how can we register our company for 5% VAT for commercial to residential conversion? We've tried to contact HMRC by phone and email, but never received response from them. Great question. Now, VAT's a complicated subject, and uh, we have a VAT team. Um, that deal with this because VAT in itself is complicated. So jump on a consultation, take up the link, come and spend some time with us. We'll put you in touch with the team that will help you work that one through and ensure you've got your structures right and how to deal with the revenue who are all now coming back to work as our DBI <laughs> come to the sales <laughs> and the rest of them finally. Okay, so you'd like Larry to send me uh, an email me to forward it on to you, yeah? Yeah, absolutely. And we'll book a consultation with the team who deal with VAT and they'll, uh, they'll work that one out. Okay, Mick says, how much are your fees? My first answer before Simon answers is uh, a lot more, a lot less than your savings. <laughs> uh, you, ought to, you ought to charge by percentage of what you uh, save because you'd earn far more. Yeah, we would. We don't do it like that. So look, I know we're a big firm, but actually we're regionally based and our pricing is very competitive. Um, not everybody has, but we have some things that we have are completely unique. And even those are when people look at the value that we do, everything's based on return on investment. So uh, we'll look at what your tax charges are, what the costs are. If you've got a slightly larger portfolio, you pay slightly more because of the work we've got to do. But, you know, some of our fees start, you know, sub 5K and go upwards. 
uh, depending on um, what the problem is we're solving, uh, what, what, which of our solutions we're using. Uh, even with gold standard, inheritance tax products, which saves hundreds of thousands of pounds, you know, starts at 15k and, 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 and goes up. And this stuff you can pay for over 12 months at 0% interest. So we make it really, really easy for people, really, really affordable. And uh, we make sure that we're presenting the right thing for the, for the, for the right client. And as I said, we've got a promotion going on in August. So when you're on the consultation, we'll tell you about that. And uh, that will save you a bottle too. So well. just thinking if someone's a 40% taxpayer, and your fee is 15 grand, is that 15 grand they can claim for their tax bill? Yeah, we put it together as professional services and um, in a way that they can, it becomes a tax deductible cost, so you get that against your costs in the current tax year, which is always helpful. Um, so really, some people so, so, that registered these they claim the VAT back to. So really your fees are almost 50% claim backable, um, so whatever your fees are, it's, it's really not 15 grand, it's really seven and a half grand. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's uh, it certainly works to the individual's advantage. And I think that, you know, once you get to year two, year three, year four, you've got all loads of upside and, you know, you might have some accountancy costs going forward, but that's the nature of being a business owner and owning companies. So, uh, yeah, very affordable. I think they're great value, our clients certainly do. I think the advice that comes with the whole team that we've got here, you know, Debbie, one of our uh, top accountants here, who often takes up, you know, a lot of the clients that come from these kind of webinars, you know, her typical client base is, you know, up to 200 properties in rental, three other developments happening elsewhere, and other investments, and she's been advising them for 20 years. So you get Debbie as your accountant, and she's heard it all, seen it all, done it all before, and she, they people absolutely love working with her own team. Okay, the next question, I'm going to be able to show off and answer it before I even ask it. And the answer is, it depends. Uh, and I can only do that because I've heard you say it many times. So now I'm going to ask you the question. Uh, Ali says, I have one HMO, should I run it for a company? <laughs> well, the answer is, it depends. It depends on lots of factors. Um, you know, have you got a commercial mortgage on that? Have you not got a commercial mortgage on that? Um, because, you know, limited companies only allow to have commercial mortgages, and most HMOs do have commercial mortgages. So actually, the cost of a big limited company for, for that particular one doesn't matter. But we've got to look at it in the wider context of your personal circumstances. And that's why we do these free consultations. And then with about one and a half grand, that's what we charge people. I mean, we're really getting it for free because of Glenn, and um, because you're part of his whole uh, investor developer support um, programs. So come and join us on the consultation. We'll look into that uh, with you. We'll run the numbers with you. We'll ask for numbers beforehand, and we'll take into context the wider circumstances that are unique to you, and we'll walk you through it. And by the end of it, you will conclude, as we will conclude, what is the best way forward for you, because we educate you in those consultations, okay. and people get great value from them and really enjoy them. Okay. Would you like another question with the same answer? <laughs> yes, this one's from Lau. Can we come out of Section 24 with only one buy to let is, that is privately held? Uh, yes, you can. Um, but is it worth uh, it? <laughs> the answer is yes, you can. Um, quite how we, we can do it instantly. It's whether it's worth your while doing it at that particular level and what your personal circumstances are. You know, if you're really a forty percent taxpayer and you've got a property, it can be quite painful. I'd like to look at the numbers on that and advise you on that. So just jump on, take a consultation up, and um, you'll get a really clear answer at the end of it. Uh, so Fitzroy and uh, we don't have the first name P Wall uh, have asked for your contact details and company details. Get all you need to do: email me at um, info at glenarmstrong.com and we will forward all your uh, uh, bits and pieces on all your inquiries onto Simon and he will um, uh, be able to deal with whatever it is you want to do. So no problem at all, drop me an email, info at glenarmstrong.com uh, and then we can um, hand you over to Simon. Um, okay, um, from Jay. 
uh, is it better to use a limited company trust structure to overcome the inheritance tax issue or via a limited liability partnership? Okay, so uh, that's a great question. For people who own property in their own name today, feeling we have to go on a journey to incorporate to move into a limited company. Now for some of you, that's going to be absolutely the right thing to do. But it will depend on your loan to value on um, your ELPs, your early redemption penalty, it'll depend on a whole load of factors that we can look at in the consultation. And if it is right for you, we can move into a limited company, we can have the trust set up, the trust can have the shares of the company, and there you go, you've got the belt and braces of gold standard. Now for others who've got uh, big old ELPs uh, with long running times on them, you know, out four or five years, or They've got a very high loan to value and the cost of refinancing and moving into a company under incorporation, but then financially may not be the right thing to do. Then an LLP um, will put you in, will put your children in the LLP, will set the structure up correctly, and then we have a way, a method of transferring equity from you to your children. And as long as you survive seven years, then that can be completed without any tax charges, and you always stay in control. You always get access to the cash. And whilst the kids have the equity, you continue to run your business and continue to own the assets and continue to be the landlord and in control of your own destiny. So the answer is we can go both ways, depends on your personal circumstances. Please reach out to Glenn, ask for the link, come and book, uh, come and book a consultation. The link will take you to Calendly. You'll be able to book in the time and date that's suitable to you. On the consultation, we'll spend an hour plus of our time. All we'll do before that is ask you to send across your financial information, the questions you've got, and any points that you think are pertinent before we do the consultation, so that on it we can work out your tax accounts beforehand, so that when we're with you, we can use our quality time together for the best outcome for for all of us, showing you return on investment, and uh, deciding on which way is the best way forward for you. Okay, thank you. Um, another question this time from uh, A. Hussain. Um, how does one choose a trustee as, after all, they have all the keys to the castle? Well, they don't have all the keys to the castle, actually. Um, I, I'm a chair of trust, uh, trustees for lots of organisations, churches and all sorts of things. And actually, our, our job is governance. It's not management and control and leadership, it's purely governance. It's making sure that the trust is doing the right thing and it's doing its right reporting. Actually, it is the protectors of the trust, which will be you. Uh, call the shots until your dying breath, uh, until your wife's dying breath, if you're married or the other way around, depending on how it works. And then your children become the protectors of the trust and they call the shots. They can buy property, sell property, they can. Uh, do all sorts of things. So the trustees really are there as, I hate the use of the word, but they're there as your, to, to do your bidding, uh, to do your wishes, and uh, have literally no authority over what happens in the day to day running of the business. Uh, they're just simply there to make sure the trust does its governance. Sadly, they get an annual fee for doing that. It's around £750 a year. But here's the good news you can choose who your trustees are. They can be your accountant, they can be your solicitor. They can be um, anyone apart from family members and people involved in the company or the business. Okay, cool. So, just as a matter of interest, okay, um, if, say, I was leaving uh, however many millions to my kids, um, but I wanted to appoint a property expert as an advisor to them, where, where would that fit into the whole thing? Would he be part of the management, the limited company, or uh, ha, ha, how would you structure that? With, if if literally I wanted to leave um, the advisor as the one trading through, because um, yeah. I'm, I'm 60 and I've got two kids of under two as well as older ones, uh, and I've yeah. I've got uh, another one due, so you know I, they're potentially not going to be old enough to have any say or control over anything um, yeah. and I've got uh, close friends who were started off as clients that have become close friends who I would trust their decisions to help grow their portfolio before they're old enough 
uh, to do it themselves. How would you do that? Yeah. So you can set up an arrangement with your trusted advisors, you know, who um, you believe will be around when uh, you no longer are. Let's just hope that's a long way out there. And the company can pay them on a retainer basis or on a uh, hours served basis to advise the children and you can put some constraints around that so they're always offering advice and uh, so on and so forth or you can make them you know depending on how close they are to you can make them a shareholder and we can put some constraints around those shares in terms of what they can and can't do uh, to hold them to uh, a degree of responsibility and um, you know if the children will be really young and it does happen you know COVID has been terrible to some of our clients you know who, I thought we were going to be here for another 20, 30 years and sadly no one will with us because they were taken by COVID. So it does happen. So there's, there's lots of different ways the company can uh, engage with specialists that you would like to be advisors to uh, your children going forward. David says, could you please give a summary of how you can avoid Section 24? Okay. So, um, there are two routes that we take people on. But I think over time, what we learned was that the traditional route that everyone talks about in corporation, where you move from having properties held in your own name under an LLP to a limited company, is great, but it takes two years and does not take you out of Section 24 until you finally move the business to a limited company in the third year. So in 2013, we created a structure actually for our landlord and then realised actually it had major benefits when Section 24 came along. So uh, we created a limited liability partnership and we created a structure around that that pretty much mitigates Section 24 immediately. We can make you, your wife, you, your kids, whoever, partners that are involved in the business. Um, the properties sit below the LLP so you remain the legal title owner. ASTs, insurance remain in your name. So we don't really disturb too much the mechanics of your existing portfolio, but the structure sitting above it and the accounting and tax treatment that applies to it means that Section 24 is dealt with pretty much immediately or as quick as we can get things set up. And I must admit that we've actually run out of our stock of LPs at the moment, so we'll buy a brand new one from this house. So within two, three weeks, you'll have a structure in place. And then Section 24 no applies to you. And then depending on your personal circumstances, well, we can leave you there just ticking away. And if you want to use the inheritance tax benefits of this, we can then appoint the kids and do some equity swaps and all sorts of things. If, however, your long-term goal is to be incorporated, then we'll run you like this for three years. And then in the third year, we'll deconstruct some of the structure above you, leaving just your LLP, and then we'll move everything with you using your conveyance so having refinanced your portfolio in advance with an offer to a limited company and then we can move into to a limited company when we do that there's no capital gains tax to pay there's no stamp duty to pay yeah that's great so the corporation washes away all your capital gains that you've built up over a period of time and may come back to that and then you're into a limited company does that does that uh, have to happen all on one day um, you mean moving from the LP to the limited company, moving all the properties across? Yes. It's a question we have asked a lot. The answer is yes, because we're moving the business, we're not moving individual properties, so we move them as a whole. So what happens is uh, the client will get, have to run, or as we're now running into the third accounting year uh, under the LLP, the client will go and get valuations on all their properties or the, the conveyance set for us. The conveyor, the limit, then you'll get a um, mortgage offer across their entire portfolio based on a commercial mortgage in the limited company from all the high street banks or other providers that are out there. Today we're seeing rates of 3% and above. Um, once those two elements are in place, the conveyor then can choose a date with everything in line and they can move the entire portfolio title. Uh, and all titles to your limited company, so that the limited company now owns all the titles on the same day and everything transfers across. And now you're operating in your limited company with your properties in your limited company, and then we can look at the exciting opportunities about putting a trust above that to own it to take it up inheritance tax, which would be the next stage. We don't do all this in one go, we do it in stages, uh, you'll be glad to know, and uh, people are really comfortable with it. Uh, is that character on TV says simples. <laughs> okay. 
uh, here we go. This is a bit of an easier one. Uh, and I, I think it's back to that same old answer again. Uh, Lau says, is it worth splitting the title between two persons if jointly held? Um, see, we find a lot of this, landlords trying to fix a problem that often uh, has impact elsewhere. And um, you are right, it's the same answer. It depends on the personal circumstances, depends on the wider uh, income and ownership and tax liabilities and where you're trying to get to, what the ultimate goal is, what your ambitions are, what you're building, what you're building with land, uh, etc. And when we understand all that, we can then say, look, here are your options. And this one seems to be the most sensible option for you. How about this? And you can look at how it works. And everything that we provide to people always gives you options. And I think that's what people most appreciate, flexibility and options with the structures that we put in place to allow them to move forward and to take advantage of that in many ways. Okay. Right, I'm conscious that um, we're creeping towards the 45 minutes. I know you're normally quite happy to run slightly over. Um, so if we got a lot of questions below us still to get through, um, what should one's net worth be in order to be worth starting a trust? Interesting. So um, if you think that, um, well, if the tax bill on your death is going to be greater than £15,000, then I'd say that's the starting point. I do not know anyone that we've looked at the trust idea with that is not getting a 10 times advantage, i.e. if it costs 10 rand, then they're saving 110,000. Um, so I think that if you're approaching, you know, two, three, four hundred thousand, of uh, inheritance tax liabilities, you know, which essentially is half your equity on death, then you need to be talking to us about that. And you know, today we talk, so if me and Glenn were here today looking at our portfolios and we were in our mid thirties and you know, we've got these vast portfolios worth millions, by the time we popped our clocks 50 years down the line and you know, average incomes could be as high as quarter million pounds, um, according to some economists, then the average price of a property will way in advance of what it's worth today, and therefore the inherent Saturn A. So that's just in our generation. If we then pass that to my children, who, you know, in their 20s, I'll allow them to go for the next 60 years of capital growth on those properties, but that will be massive. So it's not just the tax charge in your generation, it, this, these trusts last for 150 years. That's five generations it's of inheritance tax. It's kind of where the definition of old money comes from, isn't it? Yeah, that's I mean, that's it. My mentor, who was a property billionaire at the age 25, perhaps you this, you know, he said, so the property investing is when, you know, your great-great-grandma bought the whole of Chelsea and you just inherited it with no borrowing on it. You know, that's old money and that's how it'll work for your kids. You're the pioneers. So let's do what the pioneers did and do sensible tax planning. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, Gareth, the question you've asked, which I will ask in a minute, is one of those questions that um, uh, some, some people, uh, you, you've got to be careful that you never do anything because there's always what ifs. Okay. Uh, and sometimes some of my clients, I actually say to them, they've got what if itis. Um, you've only asked one off, one what if question, so uh, um, we'll eliminate you from that one. Um, but what will happen if they change the tax law? So section 24 applies to limited uh, companies after you transfer your portfolio into one. You've got to understand, why did they do this in the first place? They didn't do this to, to whack a load of landlords with tax. The reason that they did this, um, they, can, they perceived the objective of Section 24, otherwise known as tax, to reduce the number of accidental landlords operating in the market. They wanted to encourage landlords to become more professional property businesses and, inspect, and, and inspected, therefore, that what would happen is that stability and profitability sector would increase for both landlords and that tenants would get better service accommodation because the professional landlords would be uplifted. They were trying to get rid of accidental and rogue landlords. That's what they were trying to do. They've achieved that. You know, we've seen the sell-off of massive amounts of property. 
You know, I think this impact, it's impacted 8.2 million people when it first came out. I think there was something like 1.5 million landlords, of which around two to 300,000 were what I call professional landlords, people that are building a portfolio as a business long term. So I don't expect any U-turns. You know, we spent, I go to all the property shows, we sit with all the um, uh, ex-ministers and who come to the shows, and they all say the same thing. There's no U-turn on, on Section 24, it's here to stay. And, you know, given the uh, 190 billion to 350 billion hole in their funding due to COVID, they're going to use every angle they can, including taxing online purchases we heard last week, uh, to try and claw back some of those losses. So Section 24 is here to stay. Do not think that the fact they did a U-turn in Ireland, they're going to do a U-turn over here. The Irish U-turn was for a whole different set of reasons that do not apply here in the UK. So it's here to stay, folks, I'm afraid, sadly, much as it agrees with me, as a landlord. Okay. Right, um, we've still got a lot of questions to get through, so um, Jay, who re asked the question about is it better to use a limited company trust structure to uh, overcome uh, the inheritance tax? Uh, he's now asked, so could I also ask for clarification regarding stamp duty and capital gains tax will not be affected on transfer of a limited company or LLP? Okay, let me be absolutely clear that when we put anything under an LP, we do not change the legal ownership of anything. Therefore, we do not trigger capital gains tax or stamp duty. So you can be rest assured about that. When we move the business of the LP and the underlying assets that you own as part of that business to a limited company, that has traded for more than two accounting years. HMRC are quite clear. In the third accounting year, stamp duty and capital gains tax does not apply. We have a seven-page letter that goes out to your conveyor to explain to them uh, a how, why this is the case, what to do, what to file. And the biggest problem we have is with modern lawyers who've never done paper filing of stamp duty returns is how to do a paper filing because they're used to doing it online. And for this particular thing, you have to do a paper filing and post it. Um, with the capital gains tax. Um, there's no capital gains tax to pay. Now, I'm going to put a caveat on this. If, if Mr. and Mrs. Smith bought a property for £100,000 years ago, and now it's worth £500,000, and what they've done is every year they've increased the mortgage, increased the mortgage, increased the mortgage, and now they've got a mortgage of £400,000 on a £500,000 property they bought for £100,000, and the difference between the original purchase price of £100,000 and the mortgage value today of £400,000 if they use that £300,000 for the betterment of that property or for deposits and betterments of other poor property in the portfolio, all well and good. If they took it as income, then when we come to incorporate, they will get taxed on that. It's called latent gains. We spot it. As soon as we look at people's numbers, we can spot it and talk to people about it. Uh, effects, um, I'd say around 15% of the people that we talk to. Um, but if that doesn't apply to you, then no capital gains tax is applied. Uh, we do calculate the capital gains tax you would have paid, and for every pound you should have paid under this transfer, we create a pound of shares in the limited company. But the reliefs are quite clear. There's no tax to pay of those people who follow the incorporation process and are advised on incorporation, which is great. Resetting your capital gains tax liability for those who want to sell, that's not me, and that's not a lot of people that you advise, I'm sure, but there are people looking to sell then incorporating and washing away the capital gains tax liability can be a major advantage to some people. Okay, cool. Right, so um, I think with the number of questions left, we're going to try and have to abbreviate the answers a, a little bit if we could. Um, so Joanna's original question was, I already work through my own limited company, how can I avoid section 24 if I have a buy to let? Uh, she couldn't get through on the mic. So basically what she's saying is she's got a buy to let in her own name and my understanding is that she has a limited company that she runs it through as kind of the letting company type thing. Um, now that's all statements, what's the question? Uh, going back to the first thing, uh, how can I avoid section 24 uh, in that circumstance? 
Well, you can you can charge a 50, up to 15% as a letting as agent, uh, but you can't mitigate the Section 24 on the property or via that method. It, it just won't wash with the revenue. Um, so we can take the structure. Financially, the right thing for you to do, but again, let's book a consultation, let's look at your numbers, and let's just determine what is the right way forward for you. Okay, cool. Okay, right, let's. Um, right, that's a great question. Mick says, does putting a property in a trust affect further borrowing? No, because a property doesn't sit in a trust, it sits in a limited company. The shares of the company sit in the trust, so no, uh, the banks line up and allow loads of borrowing and lending as you would do normally you can buy property you can sell property um yeah you can do, you can have subsidiaries doing development you can move cash down subsidiaries follow the main limited company and do developments do other businesses do consults do all sorts of things it's a great structure okay now christine's asked a question that i've just read and um i'm struggling to understand it christine i'm sorry it says i'm a sole trader widow with no dependents. My accountants, how did you put my accounts, told me uh, too expensive to go into the limited company. Uh, and then she says, any other A venues don't intend to sell, gave seven properties. Um, I'm sorry, Christina, I'm struggling to understand what you mean. If you can clarify that, we've probably just got a bit of enough time to get through. What I would say, what I would say, Glenn, is that going into limited company is not her only option. If she's got borrowing on those properties, then we can put up a mixed property partnership structure for her. We can move her instantly, take her out of section 24. If she doesn't need another party in there, because uh, we can use a corporate entity as well. So um, they may have done it with blinkered, blinkered glasses on. So please take up a consultation. I've dealt with lots of uh, states with widowers who have property been transferred to husband to wife. And they'll quite happily talk to you about us and our services and how we've handheld them through the whole process if that helps, Christine. I think you've already answered this one, but Mick says, do you have to pay the 3% when you move from personal owned into a limited? And he means the capital gains and the stamp duty. Not if you do it correctly. Not if you do it using the corporation prices and you qualify them um, for the two accounting years. So, no. Okay, um, P. Wall says, can you move a single property into an LP and then into a limited company, or do you need more than one property in your portfolio? Yeah, great question. So I think in the thousands and thousands of cases we've done and the pre-approvals that we went through up to April 17 with HMRC, before they shut that window because they couldn't cope with the amount of landlords asking for pre-approval, um, the minimum we were able to move through was four owned by three people, two outside the UK, one in the UK with a full-time job, so the 20 and a half, they became a bit of nonsense. Uh, you can, if it's a if it's a major block, so I've done it with uh, 13 flats under one title, over four, 12 flats, 10 flats, I've done it under. Um, so again, come and spend some time with us, take a consultation, and we'll, we'll give you some advice. Okay, uh, Barbara, I think I... Uh, he says, I want to buy a new property to make my main residence. Can I put my existing residential property into my limited company? Uh, I think the process, Barbara, would be to get consent to that. Uh, and then when you apply for your mortgage, um, you've, you're doing what's called a let to buy. Um, and then I'm sure when it's in that situation, you probably uh, can do something. And I'll let Simon, you take over from there. Yeah, that's a tricky one. So um, we'd have to get under the bonnet of that of the long-term goals for you as to where best to place it and what best to do. You know, it might be worth millions, in which case I totally get where you're at. And uh, so just book a consultation and we'll uh, sort that out for you. No problem. Cool. Uh, right, Mark says, the 10-year charge at 6% of trust in that NAV seems to me to have been calculated to almost exactly offset the benefit of a trust with respect to inheritance tax. Do you agree? No, it doesn't apply to this particular trust. All that legislation you're referring to there does not apply to this particular trust. It's exempt from all of that. But it's a question we often get asked. Uh, Michael says, is the easiest stroke most immediate solution to Section 24 to get commercial mortgages 
I think that means moving forward with stuff. Um, no. The quickest way to do Section 24 is to grab, grab a consultation with me or one of my two partners, and we'll, we'll, depending on your circumstances, we'll show whether we can get you immediately out of it, but doing nothing in terms of changing your mortgages. I think he's um, more talking about buying additional properties. If it's buying additional properties in a limited company, then you're outside of Section 24. It's the only place that you are outside of Section 24. Trust, partnerships, LLPs, sole traders are all uh, under Section 24, and Section 24 applies. Okay, um, the government is reviewing capital gains tax now. Will these changes survive this review? What do you reckon to that one? Well, this can determine the thresholds at which they charge it and what percentages. Uh, they'll produce a white paper. That white paper will be circulated, be circulated before the budget, and it won't become law until next July. So we've got a lot of time to look at it, a lot of time to adjust things, but I'm not expecting any spanners in the work. I am expecting, though, that they're going to find all sorts of stealth taxes <coughs> to increase their tenants. And the best protection is to come and spend some time with us. Okay, um, right, so I'm just reading something that somebody else has put. Um, right, so last couple of questions. Gareth says, uh, this is a what if, another what if question, but a positive one. Okay. Um, uh, but he follows it is, uh, uh, what does tax, why does tax have to be taxing? And by the way, Glenn, 60 and a child under two and one on the way, you are the man. Uh, Gareth, just to let you know, I've got two under two and one on the way. <laughs> so it's three in three years. Um, <laughs> so there we go. Um, yeah, life in the old dog, yeah. Eh? Uh, right, Gareth's question was, um, what if there was a way to be tax efficient around Section 24 and if the politician changed their minds and apply Section 24 to limited, you could move the properties elsewhere? Um, I think uh, this is getting into, that, yeah, it not is. expecting any changes to Section 24 and the Liberty Commons. <coughs> there you go. They brought, they brought it in to professionalise the sector and to get rid of the accidental landlords. And if you look at the sale of vital let properties over the last two years from accidental landlords, it was something like 352 a week were coming on the market. So they've achieved their goal. Cool. Um, right, and the last question. Uh, Bernie says, can I clarify that once I have a portfolio in the LLP, I can get out of Section 24 liability? Do I have to wait until the portfolio is in the limited company? So the portfolio um, sits under the LLP and we have a structure of a mixed partnership that we will talk to you about in the consultation and immediately we are under Section 24 once all the elements of that are in place and we can normally put that into place very quickly for you, depending on what you've got. Um, no, you don't have to move to a limited company. No, you don't have to change your mortgages. No, you don't have to change the title or insurances or ASDs. They all stay the same. Cool. Uh, right. I do believe, sorry, the other ones are comments about the um, uh, me and having three kids under the age of two. I feel dog I think, think my uh, younger one will be just two when the new one's born two or three months later, so. Um, right, okay, but certainly three under three. Um, right. You mentioned earlier on, uh, we had one of the many good questions that we've been asked this evening um, to do a summary on the Section 24 and how to get around it. Um, we will be putting that summary up onto our YouTube channel uh, in the next 48 hours. Um, my videographer, YouTube man, saying so maybe yeah, Friday, Saturday. Friday, Saturday. So we'll put that up there and we will head it um, uh, exactly what it is, summary of section 24 by Simon. Um, if you do go onto my YouTube channel where a lot of my interviews are uh, available, uh, the uh, YouTube channel is called the, is it The Property or it's just Property Millionaire? 
Property Pro Millionaire Academy. It's just or Property Millionaire Academy. So even if they just put your name in, uh, I'm sure. or put my name in it, you should find it. But Property Millionaire Academy. Uh, if you uh, subscribe and you press notifications, then you'll get notifications of all the different things we add. We are trying to take a few little key bits out of every single interview we do with everyone and put on there that we think is important. Um, so you'll get the notifications and when you get the notifications, um, you'll be able to listen to the, you go and have a look at the bits that appeal to you. So, um, um, uh, had a few little uh, other comments. Gareth said, thank you, very great webinar this evening. So yeah, thank you very much, Simon. Um, and Fitzroy says, I had uh, three under three, it was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> so that, thanks Fitzroy. Um, fortunately, we have such thing as a nanny and potentially I'll get another one for nights. So. Uh, there we go. If you've got a nanny and a nighttime nanny, then uh, you you almost become a grandparent, uh, uh, where you can give them back when <laughs> when they've got some many bums and things. So there we go. And Julian finished this evening and said, "Congratulations, Glenn. Thank you, Julian. Thank you very much, Simon, for joining us." Um, oh, my absolute pleasure. So um, folks, don't forget to ask for the link, and then uh, you can book some time with us, and then we'll take care of it on a one-to-one -one basis. I think you'll really enjoy the process. Thank you, Glenn, for letting us join you. And the uh, feedback I've had from other of my clients that have been to see Simon is all very, very good. Um, so um, you're in good hands. Uh, thank you, Simon. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Please be careful. Uh, it looks like there is a like a second wave coming. Please don't be complacent. Please don't become a casualty. Uh, take care and have a very good evening.